And together we are Family, family Plot. Plot. Well, that's very nice. How is everyone today? All right. How are you? Uh, I'm I'm pretty good. I, I'm I, tired. I, I, can't, eh, I was. I took a little nap. I feel a lot better. Sue. So, uh, hey. Etsy. Um, what can I start with today? Our, how about our how, housekeeping? Um, I let's start with our Patreon. If you want to help us out through Patreon, it's a one or three dollar donation monthly. We'll be putting up a Patreon episode shortly. In fact, um, uh, we, Laura and I are actually going to do a, a bit of voice acting for uh, the Queen of Panics podcast. She has uh, several days of spooky stories, so we're going to tell one. I'm excited to do that. That's yep. going to be fun. Um, and in return, she's going to join us for a, for a Patreon episode. Plus, we've got a uh, writer joining us uh, for a Queen of... Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Jane Nightside. Uh, the author will join us for a podcast. So we got a lot coming up in that regard. Uh, so yeah, one to three dollar donations, Patreon. Uh, and if you can't do a monthly donation, you can always donate, throw us a dollar or two through Buy Me a Coffee. Uh, if you enjoy the show, uh, please share it on social media with your friends and others. Uh, if you don't enjoy the show, please keep it, keep it to yourself. yourself. Yes, yes, that's... Right. You can't say something nice, don't say oh. nothing at all. Exactly. Now, tonight, we dive into the oral tradition that eventually got written down as we examine the origin of fairy tales in this special Laura's Birthday folklore episode of the Family Plot Podcast. Where do fairy tales come from? Where do fairy tales come from? Is that what you want to know, Lexi? Yeah. Well, I think Daddy was just going to tell us. You want to sit down and listen? Yeah. But before we get into the, the, the scary fairy tales... But first... But first... Krista... Has a corner. Has a corner. you, Krista. How's your corner today? How am I today? I'm okay. I'm pretty tired. I saw Let's Not Say Her Name today, so I'm a happy kid. Okay. Well, I wasn't going to say her name. Um, but you should let, let her listen to an episode of the podcast or she knows how awesome you are. No. Um, what do you mean, no, you shouldn't? Our podcast is awesome. You're awesome on it. Uh, Why wouldn't you let somebody that you like know that? Um, I, I mean, mean, I would think that would show somebody you like them if you're willing to share something of yourself with them. It, it just, it's, I don't know. I think it seems kind of creepy. Hey, listen to my podcast. I talk about you a lot. But you don't mention her by name. It's no. okay. I don't mention her by name. I mention her a lot still. Okay. And you've talked about her three episodes in a row. But 
three episodes in a row. That's a lot more than a normal, normal, normally normal, normal. I don't know about that, but okay. All right, we're not going to push anything on you, kiddo. We support you in what you decide. So what else are you going to talk about in your corner today? Uh, you, is your Are your teachers behaving? Do I have to go no, punch them? are my them? teachers behaving? Yeah. I are think you, the question is supposed to be... You punch other. the teachers. That is not socially acceptable. All my teachers are behaving. Um, I just entered this new um, mental health program at my school. Um, I just did that today. Always important. Yep. Did you learn a lot? You don't learn in that class. Oh, okay. Um, no, I think you are. Because you're learning ways to work positively on yourself. Yeah. So you still are learning in that class. I'm still it's just not learning. traditional core subjects. Yeah, it's not core subject. It's more like since I struggle a lot, me and other kids can struggle quite a bit. Like, you know, can struggle, struggle quite a bit with, you know, learning and, you know, other things. Cool. That, that's what that's for. I like it. I wish they had, had something like that when your older brother was in school because I think it would have helped him. And it's, it's looking at, you know, not only just laziness, but that there are like behavioral and emotional things behind people having trouble it's, it's focusing not, and studying. I wish they would have had that when I was in school. Yeah, no, um, that, that's, that's just partially how it is now. Um, well, no, because I think there are a lot of schools. There are a lot of schools that still like don't do that. that. There are a lot of schools that just, they don't do that because they don't think it helps for learning, but in, in actuality, it can actually help you more with learning than some of the stuff they're doing. It's like class after class after class, and once you have sort of relief in the middle of the week where you can just sit down and talk to somebody with a group, you can feel open to talk to people when you're in a group, and it's, 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 it's really nice. Um, I like the, I like the teacher there. Her name is Miss Katie. She's That's wonderful. Good. She did not have enough coffee this morning, obviously. She was not very happy today. But she was just oh, like, why oh, hey, can I sympathize with Miss Katie on that one? Wow. She was just like, first of all, I did not get enough sleep today. I am sorry if I seem rude. I'm not. I'm a very nice person. However, don't be spreading drama. <laughs> Okay. Well then. <laughs> Speaking of drama, how's your drama class? I love my drama class. I just finished writing like sort of the baselines of my oratory. Very nice. Um I was going to talk more about that other thing. Well, go ahead. I just uh, I I just thought you would come to a stopping point. I'm sorry. No, you I talk on and on if you let me. Uh, well, that makes you my daughter, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's um, really true. They very more, about, more about school in general. This this thing that we're doing, the, the sort of service that we're doing, we do it weekly for 10 weeks, so it's not throughout the whole school year. Uh-huh. And it's on Wednesdays in the middle of the week. Uh-huh. And we join in the classroom where there's not a bunch of people. Um, it's on Wednesdays, however. Yeah, I just said that like three times. That's okay. Uh, however, it's not at the same time every Wednesday. Uh -huh. They call you down to the office at like the end of the hour. Uh -huh. And then you go with them mm -hmm. to the room. Uh -huh. And you start talking and stuff. Uh -huh. um, so I missed my whole entire math class for that. Mm -hmm. We weren't doing anything important. I'm okay with you missing math, math, math class to get your mental health up. Yeah, I'm going to miss drama next week. Uh, Again, they they have it set so that you're not missing a whole bunch. 
Yeah. Well, and you're not missing the same class every time. Yeah, so right, no. If and you, you can catch up next time in you're in class. Right. Like, you can also get the stuff from your class, and you can just be like, hey, can I get this? And blank, blank, mm -hmm. advance. And if you know it's coming, and it's like an important test or something, you can always prepare for that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can just be like, hey, can I do this this time? Um, can you call me back in later today? Something like that, when I don't have a super important class. Where, yeah. Wow. Anything else you want to cover in your corner today? Um, yeah, I'd like to talk about how my school sort of is with this, with their learning production. Um, I'd like to talk about the sort of cores that they look at, because I found it very interesting this morning when we were doing, uh, blah, 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 blah. we were doing, we were looking at sort of occupations and career, career paths. This morning I was looking at... I was looking at arts and education, which is one career path that has a, multiple, a multitude of occupations. Mm -hmm. So, it has education, uh -huh. as normal. Uh -huh. It has theater. Uh -huh. It has theater productions. It has art. It has digital media. Those are the four main ones. But with, uh, with there's a bunch of other ones. There's uh, social work, uh -huh. which would include law, sort of the stuff. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Law. Law. Yes. Um, I want to go into law, so that's fun. I really think that it's very interesting because people who do go into law and do work, like, sort of in the school, they learn more about what they're going to do. Like, they're hands-on about right. what they can do in school. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, okay, so for, so for education, not everyone does this, mm -hmm. but in education, there are people called cadet teachers who are high schoolers who go into actual, like, elementary and mm -hmm. preschools or it's kindergartens. And they'll go in and they'll work with the teachers to teach a lesson that they made specifically for themselves. Yeah. And then they actually get hands-on learning and decide if, you know, whether or not they actually want to be a teacher or whether or not they want to go into something else. Yeah. So, yeah. This, I feel like my school is pretty cool in that matter. Um, because there's a lot of those that are just like... You can go into a place, actually, and you can get hands-on learning, which most schools would not have. So, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So. And we can always call our friend Mike, and he can talk to you about, you know, law Well, stuff. I either want to be in law, or I want to be an actor. I don't want to do both. That's overwhelming. Well, um, you... Could be an I actor could. for a while and then go into law, or vice versa. I could, but that if would be you, like if a you lesson. study for law, then it it will cover you either either way though. That's what. I'm throwing out. Yeah, uh, one of the comics I worked with years ago was a lawyer, and he was doing stand up. Uh, now he's since retired and gone into law, but. He was doing stand-up for a while. He had a law degree, so when stand-up... I don't know if it quit working for him or if he just decided he wanted more regular money, but he just put his degree to use. Right, right. And I don't know. I might do that because I really do want to become an actor or actress, but at the same time, I sort of want to become a lawyer. But I know that becoming a lawyer takes quite a bit of time away from family. Not necessarily. I mean, it really depends on what lawyer sort of work you're going into. It kind of takes away from family time. Mike spends a ton of time with his family. Uh, now He's able to. He's in the sort of like type of law where he can. There are lots of laws where you can do that. Yeah, that's are, that's my but point. Like you have to, if you get in the sort of, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. 
it's whatever. It's whatever you choose to do, dear. I just want you to be happy and be able to support yourself. Yeah, I want to be able to sort of port myself, too, but with the job ideas that I'm having right now, I don't think that will be hard. That's good. <laughs> and I want you to be happy. I'm going to be happy with either of those jobs that I get. I love I love acting, and I will absolutely adore debating, even though I'm not the best at it. I That's love okay. talking with people, I'm just like, hey, no, <laughs> that is wrong. I read all these cases, and you are wrong. You didn't get that one part. That's not true. <laughs> that works. So, Krista, is that your corner for this week? Yeah, I sort of bored myself out with school. That's fine. There we go. Yay, we got some claps. Yay. Yay. Thank you for a lovely corner, Krista. Yeah. So, I also want to sort of be a voice actor. What? I want to be a voice actor. <laughs> yeah, you, you might get a chance to try. We get requests all the time from groups that need a voice actor for this, that, or the other. I would love to voice act. That would be cool. Yeah, I'll uh, start letting you know when we get requests. For me? Or for you guys? Well, we got a request. I just had me and mom doing it. It's a, like I said, it's a, it's a kind of a dating scene, but the guy's a vampire. Well, you could ask her if she has any parts full of him for maybe a younger girl that Krista would be interested in reading for something like that. Um, I think she might be caught up on this one, but. I think that's her podcast, is is all these stories. Yeah, so, that's what I'm saying, just to say, hey, we have a daughter who's interested in doing some reading stuff. So, saying? yeah, it might not be for her upcoming Halloween episode, but mm-hmm. she might have stuff that Krista can... Yeah, I could definitely voice act. I'm good at it. I can do all types of voice acting. Yeah, well, anybody who's listened to us has heard me do my New Jersey voice acting. Well, and, like, you do, like, a... Or, Mike. <laughs> you do all kinds of stuff. What's up with you? I did good. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry if that was offensive. You're fine. You're no. fine. So, today, we will focus on three fairy tales. Um, just, just because the fairy tales themselves will take some time to tell. And I feel like that's the only way to do it. Is you've got to tell the fairy tale, and then you can go into the behind-the-scenes stuff. Uh, the three fairy tales we're doing today are The Brave Little Tailor, which is also known as Seven in One Blow. Uh, we're going to do Red Riding Hood. And The Three Billy Goats Gruff. Now, the original purpose of these tales was to teach young people about things. There wasn't... Uh, it, there hasn't always been television or radio or cartoons or kids programming. True enough. Uh, so a lot of times, instead of telling people, uh, telling young kids about you know stranger danger or things like that that they could they could have happen, but uh, they told these stories to sort of warn young people. Right. For example, the brave little tailor is an admonition against pride, not like gay pride, but rather just pride in general. Pride in general. Yeah. Not everything is gay pride. I get it. After all, if the tailor hadn't been so proud of the seven in one blow, he never would have had so many troubles. It is also an exhortation to be smart and resourceful. So. I have picked these three, uh, Brave uh, Little Tailor, Red Riding Hood, and the Three Billy Goats Gruff. Um, and so we will go over them each. The longest is the Brave Little Tailor. We will each do some reading on that, and then we will split up the others. Uh, so I will begin my part of the Brave Little Tailor, also known as Seven in One Blow. Now, hold on. Hold on.
I would like to clarify which one is mine, which mom, one is mom. Which color am I? Uh, your purple mom's blue-ish. Got it. Thank you. One summer morning, a little tailor was sitting on his table near the window. In good spirits, he was sewing with all his might. A peasant woman came down the street crying, Good jam for sale, good jam for sale. That sounded good to the little tailor, so he stuck his dainty head out the window and shouted, Come up here, my dear woman, you can sell your goods here. The woman carried her heavy basket up the three flights of stairs to the tailor, who had her unpack all of her jars. He examined them, picking each one up and holding it to his nose. Finally, he said, this jam looks good to me. Weigh out four ounces for me, even if it comes to a quarter pound. The woman, who had hoped to make a good sale, gave him what he asked for, then went away angry and grumbling. May God bless this jam to give me health and strength, said the little tailor. Then, taking a loaf of bread from his cupboard, he cut himself a large slice and spread it with the jam. That is not going to taste bad, he said, but I will finish the jacket before I bite into it. He laid the bread aside and continued his sewing, happily making his stitches larger and larger. Which, doesn't that affect the jacket? I don't... I don't want to think. Yeah, it does. Um, larger stitches are more loose. They're able yeah. to come apart easier. So smaller stitches are better for when you want something to like, really... So, meanwhile, the smell of the sweet jam rose to the wall where a large number of flies were sitting. Attracted by the smell, a swarm of them settled onto the bread. Hey, who invited you, said the little tailor, driving away the unbidden guests. However, the flies, who did not understand German, would not be turned away. And they came back in ever-increasing numbers. Finally, losing his temper... He reached for a piece of cloth and shouted, Wait, now I'm going to give it to you. The bread? No, no, no. Then he hit, them, uh, hit at them without mercy. When he backed off and counted, there were no fewer than seven of them lying dead before him, with their legs stretched out. Aren't you someone, he said to himself, surprised at his own bravery. The whole town shall hear about this. He hastily cut out a banner for himself, then embroidered on it with large letters, seven with one blow. The town, he said further, the whole world shall hear about this. And his heart jumped for joy like a lamb's tail. Because he swatted seven flies? At the same time. At the same time. That's wow. pretty, that's pretty good. But have you, okay, listen. Have you ever swatted seven flies at the same time and killed them all? I have not. Exactly. However, I also have never thought, hey, if I ever killed seven flies at one time with one swipe, would I make a giant sign and hang it off the roof? That's like is that No. <laughs> yes. What? Yes. That's crazy to me. No. Okay, you killed. I am fine, but I just needed to get that out. Okay. The tailor tied the banner around his body. He wore it like a dress. More like a sash, but okay. <laughs> and set forth into the world, for he thought that his workshop was too small for such bravery. Before leaving, he looked about his house for something that he could take with him. Finding nothing but a piece of old cheese, he put that into his pocket. Outside the town gate, he found a bird that was caught in a bush. It went into his pocket with the cheese. He bravely took to the road, and being light and agile, he did not grow weary. The road led him up a mountain, and when he reached the top 
a huge giant was sitting there, looking around contentedly. The little tailor went up to him cheerfully and said, Good day, comrade. Are you just sitting here looking at the wide world? I am on my way out there to prove myself. Do you want to come with me? The giant looked at the tailor with contempt, saying, You wretch! You miserable fellow! You don't say! Answered the tailor, unbuttoning his coat. He showed the banner to the giant. You can read what kind of man I am. The giant read Seven with one blow, and thinking the tailor had killed seven men, he gained some respect for this little fellow. But he did want to put him to the test. So he picked up a stone and squeezed it with his hand until water dripped from it. Do what I just did, said the giant, if you have the strength. Is that all, said the little tailor. If that is child's play for someone like me, reaching into his pocket, he pulled out the soft cheese and squeezed it until it ran from... You until missed. it oh, squeezed it until liquid ran from it. I'm sorry, I got really confused there for a moment. Like, where? Sorry about that. That was even better, wasn't it? He said. The giant did not know what to say, for he did not believe the little man. Then the giant picked up a stone and threw it so high that it could scarcely be seen. Now, you little dwarf, do that! A good throw, said the tailor, but the stone did fall back to the earth. I'll throw one for you that will not come back. He reached into his pocket, pulled out the bird, and threw it into the air. Happy to be free, the bird flew away and did not come back. How? How did you do that, comrade? asked the tailor. You can throw well enough, said the giant. But now, let's see if you are able to carry anything. Proper. He led the little tailor to a mighty oak tree that had been cut down and was lying on the ground. He said, if you are strong enough, then help me carry this tree out of the woods. Gladly answered the little man. You take the trunk on your shoulder and I will carry the branches and twigs. After all, they are the heaviest. The giant lifted the trunk onto his shoulder but the tailor sat down on a branch, and the giant, who could not see him behind himself, had to drag along the entire tree, with the little tailor sitting on top. Cheerful and in good spirit, he whistled the song. There were three tailors who rode out to the gate, as though carrying a tree were child's play. The giant, after dragging the heavy load a little way, could go no further. And he called out, Listen, I have to drop the tree. Sorry about that. That's okay. My screen completely jumped. The tailor jumped down agilely, took hold of the tree with both arms as though he had been carrying it, and said to the giant, You are such a big fellow and you can't even carry a tree. They walked on together until they came to a cherry tree. The giant took hold of the treetop where the ripest fruit was hanging and bent it down and put it into the tailor's hand, inviting him to eat. However, the little tailor was too weak to hold the tree, and when the giant let go, the tree sprang upward, throwing the tailor into the air. When he fell back to the earth without without injury, the giant said, What? You don't have enough strength to hold that little switch. There's no lack of strength, answered the little tailor. Do you think that that would be a problem from someone who killed seven with one blow? I jumped over the tree because hunters are shooting down there in the brush. 
jump over it yourself if you can. The giant made the attempt but could not clear the tree and got stuck in the branches. So the little tailor kept underhand here as well. The giant said, if you are such a brave fellow, then come with me to our cave and spend the night with us. The little tailor agreed and followed him. When they reached the cave, the other giants were sitting there by a fire. Each one had a roasted sheep in his hand and was eating from it. Ew. The little tailor looked around and thought, It's a lot more roomy here than in my workshop. The giant showed him a bed and told him to lie down and go to sleep. However, the little tailor found the bed too large. So instead of lying there, he crept into a corner. At midnight, the giant thought that the little tailor was fast asleep. So he got up and took a large iron bar. With a single blow, he smashed the bed in two. He thought he had put an end to the grasshopper. Early the next morning, the giants went into the woods, having completely forgotten the little tailor when he suddenly approached them cheerfully and boldly. Fearing that he would strike them all dead, the terrified gi giants ran away in haste. <laughs> the little tailor continued on his way, always following his pointed nose. After wandering a long time, he came to the courtyard of a royal palace and being tired he lay down on he lay down yes okay. he lay down in the grass and fell fell asleep while he was lying there people came and looked at him from all sides and they read his banner seven with one blow oh they said what is this great war hero doing here in the midst of peace? He must be powerful, or he must be a powerful lord. They went and reported him to the king, thinking that if war were to break out, he would be an important and useful man who at any price should not be allowed to go elsewhere. The king was pleased with this advice, and he sent one of his courtiers, courtiers, yeah, courtiers to the little tailor to offer him a position in the army. As soon as he woke up, the messenger stood by the sleeper and waited until he stretched his arms and and legs and opened his eyes. And then he delivered his offer. This is precisely why I, why I came here, answered the little tailor. I am ready to enter the king's service. Thus, he, he was received with honor and given a special place to live. However, the soldiers were opposed to the little tailor and wished that he were a thousand miles away. What will happen, they said, they said amongst themselves, if we quarrel with him and he strikes against us, seven of us will fall, fall with each blow. People like us can't stand up to that. So they came to a decision and all together went up to the, to the king and asked to be released. We were not made, they said, to stand up with, to, to a man who kills seven with one blow. The king was sad that he was going to lose all of his faithful servants because of one man, and he wished that he had never seen him. He would like to be rid of him, but he did not dare dismiss him because, because he was afraid that he would kill him and all, all his people would then set himself on, on the royal throne. He thought long and hard and finally found an answer. He sent a message to the little tailor, informing him that because he was such a great war hero, he would make him an offer. In a forest, 
in his country there lived two giants who were causing great damage with robbery, murder, pillage, and arson. Mm, arson. Nice guys. Lovely. I'll edit it. Daddy can edit it. Okay. It's okay. Daddy, make sure you leave that out. But they, he, he can leave things out. It's cool. No one could approach them without placing himself in mortal danger. If he could um, conquer the and kill these two giants, the king would give him his only daughter to uh, his only daughter to wife and have his half his kingdom for a dowry. So he would marry his daughter to him, sight unseen, and he'd also give him half the kingdom. Dang, right? That's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Furthermore, a hundred horsemen would go with him for support. That is something that is something for a man like you, thought the little tailor. It is not every day that someone is offered a beautiful princess and half a kingdom. Yes, he replied. I shall conquer the giants, but I do not need need the horse need the hundred horses. Anyone who can strike you strike down seven with one blow has no cause to be afraid of, afraid of two. The little tailor set forth, and the hundred horsemen followed him. At the edge of the forest, he said to, the, to them, You stay here. I shall take care of the giants myself. Leaping into the woods, he looked to the left and to the right. He soon saw the giant, the two giants. They were lying asleep under a tree, snoring until the branches bent up and down. The little tailor, now lazy, filled both pockets with stones and climbed up the tree. Once in the once in the middle of the tree, he he slid out on a branch until he was seated right above the sleepers. Then he dropped one stone after another onto the giant's chest. For a long time, the giant did not feel anything. But finally, he woke up, shoved his companion, and said, Why are you hitting me? You are dreaming, said the other one. I'm not hitting you. They fell asleep again. The tailor threw a stone at the second one. What is, what is this? said the other one. Why are you throwing things at me? I am not throwing anything at you, answered the first one, grumbling. They quarreled for a while, but because they were tired, they made peace, and they both closed their eyes, their eyes again. <laughs> then the little tailor began his, his game again, choosing his largest stone, he threw it at the first giant with all his strength, hitting him in the chest. That is too mean, shouted the giant, then jumped up like a mad madman and pushed his, his companion against the tree until it shook. The other one paid him, paid him back in, in kind and they became so angry that they pulled up the trees and struck each other until until finally, at the same time, they both fell to the ground, dead. Then the little tailor was sitting, or I would have... Uh, you missed a line, baby. Sorry. It's okay. Jumped down. Jumped down. It is fortunate, he said, that they did not pull up the tree where I was sitting, or I would have jumped into another one like a squirrel. But people like me are nimble. Drawing his sword, he gave each one a few good blows to the chest, then went back to horsemen, to the horsemen, and said, the work is done. I finished off both of them, but it was hard. In their in their need, they pulled up 
trees to defend themselves, but it didn't help. It didn't help them. Not against someone like me who kills seven with one blow. Are you not wounded? asked the horseman. Everything is all right, answered the tailor. They did not make, they did not so much as bend one of my hair, of my hairs. Not wanting to believe him, the horsemen rode into the woods. There they found the giants swimming in their own blood. And all around they lay, they lay the uprooted trees. The little tailor asked the king for, for the promised reward, but the latter regretted, regretted the promise. And once again he began to think of a way to get the hero off his neck. Before you receive my daughter and half of the kingdom, he said, you must fulfill another heroic deed. In the woods, there is a unicorn that is causing too much, that is causing much damage. First, you must capture it. I am even less afraid of a unicorn than I was of two giants. Seven with one blow, that is my thing. Taking a rope and an axe, he went uh, into the woods. <clears throat> Once again, he told those who went with him to wait behind. He did not have, he did not have to look very long. The unicorn soon appeared leaping toward the tailor as if they wanted to spear him. The unicorn oh wait. Spear him at once. Gently, gently, said the tailor. Not so fast. He stopped, waited until the animal was very near, then jumped agile agile agilely behind a tree. The unicorn ran with all the might into the tree, sticking its horn so tightly into the trunk that it did not have enough strength to pull it out again. And thus it was captured. Now I have little bird, said the tailor, coming out from behind the tree. First, he tied the rope around the unicorn's neck. Then he cut the horn out of the tree with an axe. When everything was ready, he led the animal away and brought, brought it to the king. The king still did not want to give him the promised reward and presented a third requirement. Before the wedding, the tailor promised... Uh, wait. The tailor was to capture a wild boar that was causing great damage in the woods. Huntsmen were to assist him. Gladly, said the tailor, that is child's play. He did not take the huntsmen into the woods with him, and they were glad about that, for they had encountered the wild boar before and had no desire to do so again. When the boar saw the tailor, he ran towards him, with foaming mouth and grinding teeth, wanting to throw him to the ground. But the nimble hero ran into a nearby chapel, then, with one leap, jumped back out through the window. The boar ran in after him, but the tailor ran around outside and slammed the door. Thus, the furious animal was captured, for it was too heavy and clumsy to jump out the window. The little tailor called to the huntsman. They had to see the captured boar with their own eyes. The hero reported to the king, who now, whether he wanted to or not, had to keep his promise and give him the daughter and half the kingdom. If he had known that it was not a war hero, but rather a little tailor standing before him, it would have been even more painful for him. <laughs> the wedding was thus held with great ceremony, but little joy, and a king was made from a tailor. Some time later, the young queen heard the knight, heard the knight how her husband said in a dream, Boy, make the jacket for me and patch the trousers, or I will hit you across your ears with a yardstick. Thus she determined where the young lord had come from. 
The next morning, she brought her complaint through the father and asking him to help her get rid of the man who was nothing more than a tailor. The king comforted her, saying, Tonight, leave your bedroom door unlocked. My servants will stand outside, and after he falls asleep, they will go inside, bind him, and carry him to a ship that will take him far away from here. The wife was satisfied with this. However, the king's squire, who had a liking for the young lord, heard everything and revealed the whole plot to him. I'll put a stop to that, said the little tailor. That evening, he went to a bed with his wife at the usual time. When she thought he was asleep, she got up and opened the door and then went back to bed. The little tailor, who was only pretending to be asleep, began crying out with a clear voice, Boy, make the jacket for me and patch the trousers, or I will hit you across your ears with a yardstick. I have struck down seven with one blow, killed two giants, led away a unicorn, and captured a wild boar. And I am supposed to be afraid of those who are standing just outside the bedroom? When those standing outside heard the tailor say this, they were so overcome with fear that they ran away as though the wild horde was behind them. None of them dared to approach him ever again. Thus the little tailor was a king and remained a king as long as he lived. So that's the story. Now this tale is German in origin. Uh, it was part of the German oral tradition of storytelling until it was set down in storybooks by the Brothers Grimm. Uh, it is a story that celebrates the intelligence and resourcefulness of its hero, uh, which is how he defeats the giants and the boar and the unicorn and everyone else. It is used as an archetypical story on the Arne Thompson Uther Index, uh, where it is the archetype for the Arne Thompson Type 1640. It is known by the names The Brave Little Tailor, or Seven in One Blow. In some versions, he is married, and in others, he is single. But either way, most versions have him outsmarting his foes at every turn. Yeah. He is almost a living example of the Louis Pasteur quote, quote, Chance favors the prepared mind, which Pasteur said in 1854, 40 or so years after the story was first published. Not after it was first told. So, it, it's been around a minute. Yeah, sure, absolutely. That, that's quite a ways back, actually. But it really is definitely a very interesting story. Yes, and and to think about it, it's a story that got made into a Disney movie with uh, Mickey in the role of the... The the right, tailor. Uh, the little tailor, but I have to say that they really, they reined it in a lot, and they kept it to, like, one or two scenarios. It Disney wasn't this turned, ex extended. Disney tends to do that, where yeah. they kind of turn it in where it won't be so bad. Like, Grimm, the Grimm brothers have done, like, a lot of stuff that Disney yeah. has turned into child-friendly moving. This sure. Like Cinderella. Sure. To almost totally lose like their the ideas Grimm brothers of, literally yeah for Cinderella the kids like chopped off their toes yeah and like the heels or something yeah. like that and but in Disney they tried to fit it and it just wouldn't yeah work. they didn't and your dad and I have talked about this and that's part of the reason we're doing this and plan on going on and maybe even doing more of these depending on how this one goes. Because there are so many different, in, very interesting points that that you don't get a chance necessarily to talk about, and mm -hmm. so it's really kind of interesting. And there even are some, there even are some that you know not as many people know about. So. I will say that as I read through this and as you guys are reading through this, I didn't hear the voice of the tailor. What I heard was the voice of Mickey Mouse. Now, see, and to me, it, and, and I don't know if this is another take on a very similar story, but to me, it reminds me a lot of the dynamic of, like, the story of Puss in Boots. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what I kept, my brain kept going to as you're telling that, because I kept wanted, 
I kept feeling like it connected to the story of Puss in Boots. I, I don't know. Like I said, I mean, oh, go ahead, Krista. I guess I can see where you're seeing Puss in Boots, but also Puss in Boots didn't run away. He more of actually, sure, killed people. Uh, but that's because it's Pixar. It's not. No, I'm not. Not Disney. Well, Puss in Boots wasn't Pixar. It was. No, it wasn't Pixar. I'm it was DreamWorks. Yeah, it was DreamWorks. DreamWorks yeah. doesn't care. DreamWorks is just like. I'm y'all talking about the actual tale of Puss and Boots. Right, I get Not that. I get that. But like, yeah. But uh, yeah, in in my head, I hear the little tailor seven and one blow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I kind of just hear a high pitched voice. Seven in one blow. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I, I just. I kept picturing this little tailor as like Pinocchio from the Shrek movie. It's this little. <laughs> the sound is dude. Oh, I don't know. Real. All right. That's so, right. I got your daughter now. You can't take her back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't with you right now. Do we have a do we have a break for our sponsor? Oh, okay, that's after this one. Cool. Shocking. <laughs> All right. So, we're going to do another another story. This one I get to tell. Yay. Sir. Once upon a time. Oh, I like this one. Once, do you know what Krista's favorite Christmas present ever, ever from me was, Daddy? No. Krista, what is your favorite Christmas present from Mommy ever? What have you kept all of these years? Oh, it was like that sewing, like Mom made like a sort of cape for me, and I still I, have it in my closet. I, I made her a writing hood. I made her a princess cloak that's fitted, and I made it. I made it from scratch when we were, we, it was right after her grandma died, and we were just barely getting by, and I didn't know what we were going to do, and I put together stuff that we had been given from people moving, and people giving us stuff because we didn't have hardly anything, and made her this beautiful princess cape, and she's kept it all these years. So, Still anyway, so we're going to talk about Little Red Riding Hood, though, but that makes me think of that. Anyway, once upon a time, there was a sweet little girl, like my Krista, young, like my Lexi. Hmm, yep. Everyone who saw her liked her, but most of all, her grandmother, who did not know what to give the child next. Once, she gave her a little cat made of red velvet because it suited her so well and she wanted to wear it all the time. She came to be known as Little Red Riding Hood. One day, her mother said to her, Come, Little Red Riding Hood. Here is a piece of cake and a bottle of wine. Take them to your grandmother. She is sick and weak, and they will do her well. Mind your manners and give her my greetings. Behave yourself on the way, and do not leave the path, or you might fall down and break the glass, and then there will be nothing for your sick grandmother. Little Red Riding Hood Wait, promised... I don't think Grandma should be having wine when she's sick. Sure she should. She can have wine after she's done being sick. I don't know why she needs wine while well, she's sick. Well, wine actually, back in, in the times when this was written, people would use it to, like, fortify their health. Like, it had vitamins and things in it that they weren't necessarily that's, getting in their food. That's a future drug. What do you mean? People used to, everyone drank wine. Kids drank wine. Yeah. I <laughs> think you see those pictures of all these medieval families and these children walking around like, uh, okay, I'm just saying, they, they ain't fighting with each other or nothing because they I'm just saying, watched. in the story, in the story that I heard, it was not taking wine. 
Okay. But that is because this fairy it tale that I had. It was a basket of goodies, right? She took no. Grandma a basket of goodies. I heard it when, when, when I got to it, it was like, it was like, I think it was some fruit. I think it was cheese. Yeah. I think okay, it was a basket cheese. of goodies. Yes, so just pretend. Wine is made from grapes. What are grapes? Fruit. Okay, fairy. just, we're good. Fruit. No, There's cake, fruit though. and cake. Cake is fine when you're sick. I think okay. cake is good cheer you Okay, up. there we go. So relax. I'm not relaxed. Little <laughs> Red Riding Hood's not fooling around with anyone. Oh, is it my turn? Or no, I'm still, I'm still okay, Mom, reading. Okay, Mom, keep going. All right. Little Red Riding Hood promised to obey her mother. The grandmother lived out in the woods, a half hour from the village. When Little Red Riding Hood entered the woods, a wolf came up to her. She did not know what a wicked animal he was and was not afraid of him. Good day to you, Little Red Riding Hood. Thank you, wolf. Where are you going so early, Little Red Riding Hood? To grandmother's. And what are you carrying under your apron? Grandmother is sick and weak, and I am taking her some cake and wine. We baked yesterday, and they should give her strength. Little Red Riding Hood, just where does your grandmother live? Her house is a good quarter hour from here in the woods, under the three large oak trees. There's a hedge of hazel bushes there. You must know the place, said Little Red Riding Hood. The wolf thought to himself, Now there is a tasty bite for me. Just how are you going to catch her? Then he said, Listen, Little Red Riding Hood, haven't you seen the beautiful flowers that are blossoming in the woods? Why don't you go and take a look? And I... Don't believe you can hear how beautifully the birds are singing. You are walking along as though you were on your way to school in the village. It is very beautiful in the woods. Little Red Riding Hood opened her eyes and saw the sunlight breaking through the trees and how the ground was covered with beautiful flowers. She thought, if I take a bouquet to Grandmother, she will be very pleased. Anyway, it is still early, and I'll be home on time. And she ran off into the woods looking for flowers. Each time she picked one, she thought that she could see an even more beautiful one a little way off. And she ran after it, going further and further into the woods. But the wolf ran straight ahead to Grandmother's house and knocked on the door. Who's there? Little Red Riding Hood, I'm bringing you some cake and wine. Open the door for me. Just press the latch, called out the grandmother. I'm too weak to get up. The wolf pressed the latch and the door opened. He stepped inside, went straight to the grandmother's bed, and ate her up. Oh my gosh. Then he took her clothes and put them on and put her cap on his head. He got into her bed and pulled the curtains shut. Little Red Riding Hood had run after flowers and did not continue on her way to Grandmother's until she had gathered all that she could carry. When she arrived, she found to her surprise that the door was open. She walked into the parlor, and everything looked so strange that she thought, Oh my God, why am I so afraid? I usually like grandmothers. Then she went to the bed and pulled back the curtain. Grandmother was lying there with her cup pulled down, with her cap pulled down over her face and looking very strange. Oh, grandmother. What big ears you have, all the better to hear you with. Oh, grandmother, what big eyes you have, all the better to 
see you with. Oh, grandmother, what big hands you have. All the better to grab you with. Oh, grandmother, what a horribly big mouth you have. All the better to eat you with. And with that, he jumped out of bed, jumped on top of poor little Red Riding Hood, and ate her up. <gasps> You shouldn't have Right? As soon as the wolf had finished his tasty bite, he climbed back into the bed, fell asleep, and began to snore very loudly. A huntsman was just passing by. He thought that it was strange that the old woman was snoring so loudly, so he decided to take a look. He stepped inside, and in the bed there lay the wolf that he had been hunting for such a long time. He has eaten the grandmother, but perhaps she can still be saved. I won't shoot him, thought the huntsman. So he took a pair of scissors and cut open his belly. He had cut just a few strokes when he saw the red cap shining through. He cut a little more, and a little girl jumped out and cried, Oh, I was so frightened! It was so dark inside the wolf's body! And then the grandmother came out alive as well. Then Little Red Riding Hood fetched some large, heavy stones. They filled the wolf's body with them, and when he woke up, he tried to run away. The stones were so heavy that he fell down dead. <laughs> Gonna die when you open your stomach. Right. When they open your stomach. <laughs> the three of them were happy. The huntsman took the wolf's pelt. The grandmother ate the cake and drank the wine and that Little Red Riding Hood had brought. And Little Red Riding Hood thought to herself, As long as I live, I will never leave the path and run off into the woods by myself if my mother tells me not to. They also tell how Little Red Riding Hood was taking some time taking some baked things to her grandmother another time when another wolf spoke to her and she want and spoke to her and wanted her to leave the path. But Little Red Riding Hood took care and went straight to grandmother's. She told her that she had seen the wolf and that he had wished her a good day, but had stared at her in a wicked manner. If we hadn't been on public on a public road, he would have eaten me up, she said. Come, said the grandmother. Let's lock the door so he can't get in. Soon afterwards, the wolf knocked on the door and called up, called out, Open up, grandmother. It's Little Red Riding Hood, and I'm bringing you some baked things. They remained silent and did not open the door. The wicked one walked around the house several times and finally jumped onto the roof. He wanted to wait until Little Red Riding Hood went home that evening. Then he then follow her and he eat her up in the darkness. But the grandmother saw what he was up to. There was a large stone trough in the front of the house. Fetch a bucket, Little Red Riding Hood, she said. Yesterday, I cooked some sausage. Carry the water that I boiled them with to the trough. Little Red Riding Hood carried water into until the large, large trough was clear full. The smell of sausage arose into the wolf's nose. He sniffed and looked down, stretching his neck so long that he could no longer hold himself, and began to slide. He slid off the roof and fell into the trough and drowned, and Little Red Riding Hood returned home happily and safely. safely. All right, before we talk about this story, let's take a moment for a word from our sponsors. Hey, yes, dear. I feel sponsored. Yay. I also feel sponsored. Yay. 
Okay. All right. So this is the German version of the tale again. Uh, in the Ital in the Italian and Russian versions, the grandmother and Red Riding Hood are eaten and freed by the woodman woodsman when he uh, cuts the wolf open. Uh, because apparently in Italy, Germany, and Russia, wolves don't chew. Interesting. Um, another thing is in the like America version, like children, children, like little people, little, uh, not little people, but like little children. They're just like the wolf actually locks the grandma up. Uh, yeah, I've seen it told that way as well. Uh, now, this story is, um, uh, well, again, this is the story of an ordinary person, in this case, a young girl, outsmarting a monstrous opponent, in this case, a wolf. Sure. <clears throat> now, this story is all about the fear about young women growing up. Uh, both their menstruation and their sexual awakening are touched upon in the story. Mm, okay, I guess I can kind of see that. It is again an archetypical story that is uh three 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 on the Arn Thompson scale. It again comes from an oral tradition and was published in the early eighteen hundreds as by the Brothers Grimm. You can listen to our friends Grimm. over there at Astonishing Lots of Legends again. You're using like big words. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, he is using big words. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, you've been listening. Well, okay, first of all, sometimes I have to use big words, like yeah, the scale here is one that, like, it you started as... translate the name of a scale unless there's an actual name that makes it easier. You, you can't, though, because these are the names of people. Like, the scale was originally cr created by something or other Arn, a German guy, mm -hmm. and then someone else came along, an American, I want to say, and sort of reused the scale, but kind of redid it, and then it became the Arn Thompson scale, wow. and then... Because Arn and Thompson. Right. Yeah. And then and Uther started using that same scale after they had both done their bits, but he changed the scale a little bit, and now it's the Arn Thompson Uther scale, or the ATU scale. ATU. Interesting. So, yeah, that's where all that comes from. But, yeah, it, this, is, this is all about the fears of little girls growing up, um, which I kind of, you know, am all about because Chris and... Lexi. Not she Lexi, but yeah, Lexi. Yeah. <laughs> she's, she's going through one of those kid phases. So, uh, but again, like I said, it comes from an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. um, like, it, it, And again, like the Italian and Russian versions, they make sausage out of the wolf. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've so heard that too. Yeah, I've also cool. heard of that one. Um, I haven't read that one in particular, but I have heard about the one where the wolf just shoves the grandma in the closet. The same, it's this, the words are said the same each time though, so it's sort of just like, nah, what big hand you have, all that. Yeah. That's all in the same order all, all the time. Unless they like... Sometimes they take a couple out in comparison to what I read. I think sometimes, like, with big eye, with ears better to hear you with, eyes better to see you with, teeth better to eat you with, kind of yeah. thing. Yep. And, and, and in American stories, she tends not to get eaten. Um, That's true. A lot of times, she's the hero. Yeah. Yeah. That She goes and gets the woodsman or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in American stories, she tends not to get eaten, but in most of the original European tellings, uh, she's eaten and, well, and she's the not. Huntsman, the Huntsman comes and saves them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. She's not dead in any of them, though. Neither of them die. Yeah. Unless, like, people want to make it really gory. Well, again, like I said, uh, apparently in Europe, wolves don't chew, so. Apparently. Uh, that that's that's my. I thought only owls did that, but no, I guess not. <laughs> well, they say sharks do that too. Some sharks might actually swallow. Like like they just 
Well, and I know snakes do. Snakes don't tear things up. They snakes squish them don't. And then they, um, yeah. Also, orca whales. They'll just open their mouths. Or no, they won't even open their mouths. They'll keep their mouths closed and the little fish that they need go through their teeth. But those aren't orca whales. Those are blue whales. Yeah, blue whales. The bigger ones. Right, right. <clears throat> All right. Try again. Once upon a time, there were three billy goats who were to go up the hillside and make themselves fat. And the name of all three was Gruff. And the name of all three was Gruff. Really? There are, all of their names were Gruff. Apparently? Yeah. Huh. On the way up, there were... I wonder how they tell each other apart. Probably different markings. Uh, one's... So, one's... I mean, it's like... They Yo, Gruff! Yo, Gruff! Oh, what's up, man? They bought a different. They go. Uh, like, that would be really confusing, like at uh, a picnic uh, or a restaurant. They do after grass. What? No, they bought different. They bought different. I bet they bought different. I bet they. I bought. actually, if you read the story, they 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 wow. sort each other by size. They do. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. number one. Sorry. Rough number two. Mom, shush. Go ahead. Go ahead. Anyway. I didn't. No, 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 no! I really like went off on a tirade. No, you're you're fine. You're, you're fine. You're like, dude, honey, just let her read the story. <laughs> no, you're good. You're fine. I just I need to make sure that I know where I am because while I zoom in really close, there's still ways for me to get lost because there's like three other lines. Anyway, on the way up was a bridge over. Over a cas- cascading stream. Cascading? Cascading. Yeah, that was great. That was cascading awesome. Cascading stream. They had to cross. And under the bridge lived a great ugly troll. With eyes as big as saucers. And a nose as long as a poker. Mom, stop. That last part. Hey, do you not remember the Dora episode with the three Billy Gro- Goats Gruff? I do remember I'm it. I'm the old troll who lives under the bridge. <laughs> so first of all came the young Billy Goat. <laughs> Billy Goat Gruff. Sorry. To cross the bridge. Trip, trap, trip, trap. Went to cringe. Who's tripping over my bridge? Roared the troll. Oh, it's only I, the tiniest Billy Goat Graf. I'm gonna go up to the hillside to make myself fat, said the Billy Goat with such a small voice. Now I'm, now I'm coming to... To gobble you up, said the troll. Oh no, pray don't take me. I'm too little that I am, said said the billy goat. Wait a bit till the second billy goat grass comes. He's much bigger. Wait, which one's this? Well, be off with you, said Oh yeah, it's the troll. Well, be off with you, said the troll. A little while after came the second Billy Goat Gruff to cross the to cross the bridge. Trip, trap, trip, trap, trip, trap with the bridge. Who's that tripping of tripping over my bridge? Roared the troll. Oh, it's the second Billy Goat Gruff. And I'm going up to the hillside to make myself fat, said the billy goat, who had such a small voice. Now I'm coming to gobble you up. Said the troll. Oh, no. Oh, wait, no, never mind. Yeah, you were great. Oh, no. Oh no, don't take me. 
wait a little bit till big till the big billy goat gruff comes. He's much bigger. Very well. Be off with you, said the troll. Go. But just then came the big billy goat gruff. Trip, trap, trip, trap, trip, trap. Went the bridge for the billy goat. It was so heavy that the bridge creaked and groaned under him. Who's that tramping all over my bridge? Roared the troll. It's I, Big Billy Gruff, said the go Billy Goat, who had an ugly, hoarse voice of his own. Now I'm coming to gobble you up, roared the troll. Well, come along. I've got two spears, and I'll poke your eyeballs out out your ears. I've got I've got besides two curling stones I've got besides two curling stones and I'll crush you to bits body and bones that was what the big billy goat said and he flew at the troll and poked his eyes out with his horns and crushed him to bits, body and bones, and tossed him out into the cascade. And after that, he went up to the hillside. There the billy, the billy goat, got so fat that they were scared to, scarcely able to walk home again. And if it if the fat hasn't fallen off off them, why they're so still fat. And so snip, snap, snout, this tail pulled out. <laughs> so that's the Billy Groats Goat's Gruff. That's the Norwegian version of the tail. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Polish version, a wolf is the villain. And in the German version, a wolf is the culprit as well. Uh, this tale is an exhortation against greediness. <laughs> After all, if the troll or wolf had settled for the small goat or the medium-sized goat, he would have had a meal. But by waiting for the largest, he wound up dead and didn't get any meal whatsoever. Again, it also encourages normal folks to use their smarts to deal with problems. Further, Fairy trails, tales in many ways replace the stories of gods and heroes once told before the Dark Ages, as if the gods and monsters of the world had somehow become weaker, and one no longer needed to be a god or even a hero to fight them. Uh, take on it, absolutely. Yeah, so, and I will say, of all the things we covered, I don't know if Disney has ever done, done the Billy Goat's Gruff. No. Or a version of it, but I do remember in... Um, Skyrim, that if you're adventuring, at one point you will come to a bridge with three goats on it and a dead troll underneath it. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Um, this door, I got so tickled in, in the middle of it there because Dora the Explorer did had an episode with the three Billy Goats Gruff, and of course they Nickelodeon did, love Nickelodeon, and love some of the things that they've done with children's programming, but they totally, you know, they have this hairy, dancing, singing, grumbly, I'm the grumpy old troll who lives under the bridge, and he had song, and he, and he danced on the bridge. And of course, at the end, it's Dora the Explorer, so everybody, every, everybody ends up wonderful at the end of the day. But I was getting a, that tickled me when she was talking about it because it kept making me think of that. I'm the grumpy old troll who lives under the bridge. Right, right, and no. oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You were talking first. No, go ahead, Krista. No, you're okay. Go. 
Mm-hmm. I now I forgot what I was gonna say. And they probably I feel like Disney on like Mickey Mouse Clubhouse or something um did a similar like D It's possible they did from, something similar, yeah. Um story because I could be totally confusing Dora the Explorer for Pete mm-hmm. on Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Or both. Or, yeah, I really it's entirely possible. Do you remember what you were gonna say? No. Nope. Okay. Oh, I messed it up. Gotcha. Um, I think that if you're going to be smart with choosing your food, if you're going to choose food in general, out of, like, the biggest to smallest, choose the middle, man. You're still going to get pretty full. You're not going to get too full. Not too much left behind. It won't rot. And... You're still getting good food. Little, too small. Big, too big. You're gonna either get fought or you're gonna eat it. Brings, it brings to thought the You're gonna eat it and it's... Bird in the hand worth two in a bush. So if you have something right in front of you that you can take, why wouldn't you take that so that you don't go hungry instead of waiting... To get something better. Yeah. And honestly, this goat was probably going to kill him anyway. The big goat was probably going to kill him anyway. Because, I mean, you ate his friend. Yeah, yeah, there's that. I'm not sure which version of the tale it is. But in one of the versions um, with the wolf, like... The wolf is is basically saying the same thing as the troll is, and so, but the wolf, like, comes up for the third goat, and he's like, what's that on your head? Oh, those are my horns. Uh, Those are my powder horns, so I can fire bullets at you. And then, because, you know, like, rams will rub their heads on their side, and he does that, and the wolf thinks he's loading the guns in his head, and so runs away, falls off the bridge, and dies. Oh, fun. Wow. That's a better burger. So, yeah, I, I just... Like I said, you when these were first told, they and, and I'm curious as to how they changed through the oral tradition, and I couldn't find any information on it. Mm-hmm. Like, was the first story just one Billy Goat Gruff? And then they added the other two as they told it over time? No, because, well, no, because if, there's a wolf, have, uh, if there's a wolf, its instinct, if it finds food, is to attack and eat. Because it is there in front of them. They do not care. It is instinctual. They will go for it. But if it's a troll, I could maybe understand. <laughs> But that I'm just saying, yeah, I, I wonder how the stories were originally. Because essentially, when stories like this get told time and time and time again, everybody sort of adds their own take on it. Right. right. And the version we tell now is the version that, for the most part, the Grimms like wrote down. Like- 20 years, there's going to be a different version that is sounds completely different. Well, but that makes sense if you think about it, because look at the difference between what Dad was talking about when we talked about Red Riding Hood and all of the things that these were meant to mean back then, but I don't even know necessarily that if we hear that without that context, that that is what our children get out of those stories now because of the world that they live in. No, um, people from, I don't know, 50 years ago can hear these sort of like fairy tales now and they can think something totally different from somebody who's born right like maybe 20 years ago but i mean even you you don't i don't see this as the same way that maybe you or dad sees it absolutely not because everyone has different views well we've grown up in different worlds yeah so i mean just the whole thing. It, it's really, it's really how your perspective is, and it's really how you'd like to change the story, and how you'd say you'd like to, you know, 
bring it up in your own mind or outside to other people and say, here, here's my opinion. Do you agree with this? If not, that's okay. It can just be my opinion. Well, and you got to remember that back in the day, this was how parents taught their kids things. Right. They didn't sit them down in front of Disney. They didn't. They right. just. It's, okay, but it's it's. You're right. Exactly. That's how it is. That's how it's been for years. Romans did that. Romans created stories with their Roman gods and goddesses to create a story for the children and who they're around to show, hey, don't do this. Tells a story. Mm -hmm. It tells you what can happen. Right. Right, right, right. So it's been like this for years. It's just different stories. That's why I'm saying it can transfer into different things throughout the years. Right. And that's also why you have different versions in different parts of the world. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. different all over the place. People from Rome, Romans, or not Romans. Where where did they live? Italy. Italy. People in Italy saw things much different back then than somebody from Japan. Japan told different stories than Italy. Much different stories. That's yeah, why well, it's so different. Yeah, because they didn't really have much contact with the with the Western world back then. They didn't have much contact then. They. I mean, so, it, people can still tell stories from their state. People can still tell stories from their state now. Uh, but, again, it's it might not change because so many generations have gone on through where people have just been like, this happened back then, I'm going to stick to my belief, but in it, if anybody else tells that, I might stick that with my beliefs. It's not going to change anything. It's just going to lay on top of their already beliefs, if you know what I mean, sort of like a table. Right, right, right. Now, you take the top part off if you find something that, you know, you think is better, or if you just find out that you don't agree with it anymore, but you can also keep it on. It doesn't have to move. Right. And here's the thing, I... When Laura first came up with the idea, and this has been a while back for for uh, origins of fairy tales, I originally thought they would all come from kind of the same place. But that's not the case at all. I literally, to do them all, we would have to take every fairy tale and and then give it its own story and its own little origin, like we did this with this episode. And so we may do that in future episodes, depending... It, it would take a long time. You could it make would, a, because you could take, make a you whole, whole podcast, podcast. Yeah, You absolutely. could make a whole podcast of this called something like uh, Modern and Olden Day Fairy Tales or something right. like that. And you could put it all in different episodes, part one, different stories about, you know, sort of like yeah, I mean, Red Wolf and really down in on the Red, the yeah. Little Red Riding Hood. You could take every story from different countries. Countries, heck, you could make a part two with how many different views there are in different countries. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, see, and and just like I, because I started this new job. <clears throat> Wednesdays during the day are the days I do work on, are, are going to be the day that I, I work on gaming stuff, right? And so today, I was working on the next, well, not the next D&D adventure, but the one after that. And there is some stuff that crept in from this episode. So. I'm a roster. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, so definitely there is some stuff to stuff here. Um So so Krista, just this episode, you know, summary, right. final thoughts, what do you think? I think I think I said most of my part. I think I said a lot of what I believe. But if I had to sum it up, if I absolutely had to I'd say that everybody has a different view of how we should do things, and I think everybody has a different view of what could happen if you don't do things a certain way. And I think this, these fairy tales are something that people are creating to show you how they think. 
And the reason why people change it up so much is because sort of they've had experiences with something that is like they sort of relate to the fairy tale or they know something could change within that fairy tale if something else happened. Sort of a cause and effect type thing. Sure. And it can also relate to your actual life. So what was your favorite fairy tale that we did today, that we covered today? I have different reasons for why I like all of them. The last one, it, it tells you, I, I feel like I don't have a favorite necessarily. I have favorite parts in all of them. I don't necessarily have a favorite on its own. I feel like I really like the, like the sort of plot lines of the little tailor, but I also, you know, like how the end of Little Ed Writing Hood turned out. Okay. Han, your final thoughts? And... I'm disappointed in us for not mentioning the very real moral of the story of Little Red Riding Hood of Don't Talk to Strangers. Yes, yeah. And we didn't bring that up, so I just wanted to make sure that we clarify. Don't children, talk to don't talk to strangers. Right. Strangers, but... don't talk to children. Fair, right. right. I, I have trouble with that one. I should be ashamed. Never mind. Um, children are so cute. I don't want to steal your children. I just want to admire them. I love children. I even love mine, even when they're mean to me. I love you, mean. <clears throat> and I'm the grumpy old troll that lives under the bridge. What's your favorite? Um, yeah. See, I still say the Little Red Riding Hood, I've seen so many different bits and pieces. The, the Little Tailor, I've seen different bits and pieces. I wonder, is the Brave Little Toaster written off the Brave Little Tailor? No, the Brave Little Toaster is a story all of its own that was written in a book. But it's not a fairy tale, it was just a book. Wow. Cool. Okay. I don't know why that just... Because the name is very silly. Right, right. Which, when I was doing the search, uh, uh, Brave Little Tailor... So did Brave Little Toaster. And right, I was, yeah. right? Yeah, it popped up Brave and probably Little... probably Little Gingerbread Man. And then you popped up... What? The, the Gingerbread Man? Gingerbread Man. I had that... Oh my goodness. I'm just getting Miss, flashbacks Mr. from... Mr. Felber... Mr. Felber had everything gingerbread in him when she was in kindergarten. Okay, he was I like want to talk about a little story from kindergarten. He was the best kindergarten, kindergarten teacher ever. I want to talk about a little story from kindergarten now. Okay, okay. quickly. So, quickly? Okay, I'm sorry, not quickly. Go, stop. Okay. Um, I got so... <laughs> We went in, so it was around Christmas time, and we went into the cafeteria, right? We had these little cafeteria tables set up already because, you know, breakfast had just happened. They hadn't put it away because Mr. Felber and some other, like, kindergarten teachers, because it was a building full of other teachers as well. But, like, oh, the kindergarten teachers, cool. Yes. It was, it, okay, but there are specific, like, schools for kindergarten teachers. Which is why I specify. Gotcha. Okay. But Mr. Felber took us to the cafeteria. There were tables set up with the pieces of paper that had, like, gingerbread men on them. We would color our own gingerbread men. We went out of the cafeteria. We went back into the classroom, and we saw our gingerbread man, like, hanging from the ceiling. And we thought that was really cool. We thought that was really fun. Um, we had a gingerbread man in that classroom, and we also had, um, oh, what is it called? Those, the elf on the shelf. That was just, had cookies. It had cookies right there. Very nice. Mr. Felber was big into gingerbread man. Everything in that class was gingerbread. Everything in that class was cookie baked. <laughs> he loved cookies. Sure did. I miss having a male teacher, I'm gonna be honest. 
You have several male teachers. Now I do. Know what you're talking about? Now I do, but they were they're never as nice as Mr. Felber. I miss Mr. Felber. I mean, yeah, that was. Well, he had multiple kids go into teaching. That yeah. says something. Yeah, that that does. When you are a teacher and you make such an impression that three out of your five children or something, I, I don't remember, I believe he had a big old, um, really good-sized family. Um, anyway, um, yeah, his children and his children's spouses, several were teachers as well, and all had worked in the same school district. It was kind of cool. Anyway. <laughs> but that aside, not, not that it's not important, that well, aside, um, I don't know. I guess it's interesting to me that even in the Middle Ages, when, like, media? There, well, there wasn't any media, but well, rather than like tell, tell their kids, don't talk to strangers, they told them Little Red Riding Hood. Right. Yeah, they still use this kinder, gentler language with their children, almost. that I that, And I find that kind of interesting. I feel like the story sort of helps them understand. But I also, my favorite tale is the Three Billy Goats Gruff, mostly because I like the big billy goat coming out at the end and going, what, you're a troll? I'm not scared of trolls. Pow. Bye. <laughs> All right. Look, grass time. I'm hungry. <laughs> Yeah, I feel that hasn't fallen off of them. They're still fat. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, I feel like just the stories go through easier than the words because like the stories are come like sort of collected. They have a sort of main idea, and they have like softer, not as hard words. You can understand the plot lines. However, when you're just like big words, understand now. What's the kid gonna do? Sit there and cry? No, he doesn't know what to do. Big birds understand now. <laughs> well, to our listeners, I want to say thank you for listening. Always thank you for listening. We have reached the the end of our show. Happy birthday, my dear Laura. I know it's it's a little early. Like this episode will drop the day before, but still. Happy birthday, mom. Uh, thanks to Bill Barrent, who does our theme music. Thank you, Bill. Uh, if you need music for a project, Bill's your guy. You can reach him at Bill Barrent, B-E-H-R-E-N-D-T, at Bill. sbcglobal.net. Thanks, Bill. Thank Aww. you, Bill. Uh, also, thanks to Paige Elmore of Reverie Crime Podcast. If you need <clears throat> a true crime podcast, uh, that doesn't have a 14-year-old on it, uh, uh, Paige has you covered. We do true crime a little here. Um, I'm but, fine. But, uh, yeah. I, also, Paige has a Canva addiction and got together with our Krista to do our logo art, so thank you, Paige. Thank you, Paige. Also, thanks to Aaron Ganurk of the Big Dumb Fun Show, who continues to promote us locally. Uh, what did you think of this episode? Tell us on our Facebook group. Uh, got an eye for a, an idea for an episode? You can tell us that in our Facebook group as well. Uh, join us next week as we end September by discussing the life and times of Butch Cassidy. So a little true crime, a little history. Wow. We'll go with it. Good way to end out before we get into spooky season. Exactly. Uh, or maybe we'll cover something else. Who knows? Uh, bye! Bye! <laughs>